Welcome to the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, your guide to motorsport sponsorship. Here's your host, Josh Weesey. Welcome to the 200th episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, which is powered by Four Wheel Parts. I am... I don't even know what to say right now. Like, it's just crazy to me that this is episode 200. I feel like I just started this yesterday, but it has been three years and roughly six days since the first episode went live. Uh, That was December 6th of 2016. That was with Tristan Lowe. He was an ATV racer and, you know, a very gracious first time guest. Uh, you know, he helped me in more ways than just coming on as the first episode. You know, he helped me kind of map out a little bit of a strategy ahead of time. It was uh, it was a lot to take on for a first episode, and it it did way better than what I was expecting. Um, and it actually was funny. It, we released it um, almost on accident. I wanted to do a test run, and uh, it basically it it went beyond that. And I was really excited afterwards, and I was like, oh wow, I. I want to keep on this, so I'm going to keep going, and uh, yeah, haven't stopped since then. It's been at least one episode every week since December 6th of 2016, and at some point I added um, live shows, and that turned it into six episodes a month, and looking back on it, I'm like, gosh, you know what? I've learned a ton in the whole process. I didn't know anything about podcasting ahead of time, and yeah, I was like, I need to share this. Um and it wasn't until recently when someone else and another guest and I were talking about it, like, man, you should share that. You know, I think it might have been George Hamill just recently. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, creating a podcast. That's something he's doing, and it's part of his content strategy now. I was like, you know what? I need to share what I've done. Um, I've helped a number of other podcasts get started since I started mine. And why not help a few more people? So this show is all about that. It's all about how to start a podcast. Now, I'm going to give you as much information as possible but it's not going to be all of it but i think if you go through this show you should be able to get a pretty good start on starting your own podcast but so before i get into the show here there's a few people i'd like to to talk about and you know thank but first off i want to tell you a little bit about four wheel parts you know i'm grateful to have uh even have sponsors for a show i think that's pretty exciting um, but, you know, Forward Parts has been here for a while. Before that, Amswell was our title sponsor. Um, Amswell is still a part of the show, which is awesome. And, uh, you know, they've got um, some pretty neat stuff out there. I think Forward Parts does a really good job of keeping their marketing content fresh. Um, and they've got all sorts of, you know, gift ideas, specifically right now for the holidays. So they have this thing called the Holiday Gift Guide. Um so I'm actually going to click through it a little bit right now, real time. You know, they've got this where you can shop tires and wheels, shop sale items, and then gifts under 25, gifts under 50, gifts under 100, gifts under 200, uh, gift cards. It's just kind of a, a neat little setup to help you, you know, walk through this. So if you're if you're listening to the show and you're thinking of a, a friend uh, or family member that just loves truck parts, um, hey, and if you're listening to the show, you probably have plenty of those. <laughs> Uh, and, and if not, if you don't have these friends, you can buy things for me. Uh, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but either way, you are kind of running out of time, though. So <laughs> uh, it's December 12th when this episode releases. You don't have that much time till Christmas. So get over to 4 uh Check out this holiday gift guide um, and buy some cool stuff, you know? Like I said, you can still buy it for me. And you know what? If it is later than the 25th when I receive my present from you, that's okay. I will forgive you for that. Um, But I also want to thank a number of other partners that make this show possible. First, Amsoil. They provide amazing lubrication products, and they are a company that runs on freedom. You can find out more at amsoil.com slash rider. Solderwell. They produce game-changing metal bonding technology, and they're ready to rescue your race. TopThePodium.com. They're experts in motorsports, sponsorship, website creation, and resume building. And then Crash Attic Industries. They provide human protection and extreme racing products. I also want to shout out some of our other partners. MBRP, HMK USA, Studboy Traction, and High Octane Coffee. 
And I'd love to get your feedback. The best way to hear that and uh, record that is if you head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. Super easy to do, but honestly, a lot of people don't know how to do it. And if you don't, let me know. Uh, or pull up that little friend of yours named Google and uh, yeah, leave that rating and review. It's huge for the show. It's very important. Uh, and then the last but not least, probably... Definitely not the least here. <laughs> if you subscribe, whatever platform you use for your podcast, Podbean or Stitcher or Apple Podcasts, whatever it is, subscribe so you don't miss upcoming episodes. They'll download right to your phone. It's actually a lot easier than if you're just listening to the website um, or if you're listening to this on YouTube, which I didn't even know that people did that for a while. If you're listening on YouTube, this is a lot easier if you just download it straight to your phone through one of these podcast apps. But that's really it for this intro. I want to leave you with a message from Joe Sylvester uh, of High Octane Coffee. This is our High Octane Coffee marketing tune-up. And yeah, he's basically going to tell you a little tidbit of advice about sponsorship. And then right after that, we will get into the show about how to start a podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? Joe Sylvester here with your High Octane Coffee marketing tune-up. Today, I want to mention sponsor testimonials and how you should definitely always utilize them in your proposals and your sponsorship overviews. Nothing speaks to a company and makes you much more reputable than the testimonial of current marketing partners. Uh, reach out to them whenever you're building your deck for the new season and say, hey, I just need a couple sentences from you about your experience working with me. Put a picture in of you and your sponsorship rep uh, in your proposals, as well as the quote in their name and the company that they're from. I, I have always been told about my proposals that that is one of the best parts of it, and it definitely speaks volumes to companies that they know that there are other companies out there putting their name on the line uh, rep, you know, for your program and that they believe in you as a representative of their company. So definitely use testimonials to your advantage. Utilize those relationships. And generally, you'll find that your your representative from your sponsorship company uh, will be more than happy to do that for you, and I uh, will actually be honored that you wanted to include their uh, their testimonial in your proposal. So that's it for today. Thanks. All right, it is only fitting that on this 200 episode, that tell you how to start your own podcast. And uh, I don't know, you might be thinking, why would I do that? Am I promoting competition? Like, do I want people uh, to take my downloads? And uh, yeah, the answer is yes. I am definitely promoting competition. You know, part of my mission involves growing motorsports in its entirety. And I think podcasting is a great way to do that. Um, plus, I just like helping people. Um, I do feel that podcasting is, um, you know, something simple uh, oh, wow, I say simple, and then I'm going to go through this massive, complicated uh, thing, and I'm going to complain all the time about how hard it is. But either way, it, I think it's a relatively simple way to get your message out there. Um, and I, I do think that it is an ext a nice extension of a brand. So we'll, we'll talk a lot more about this, but essentially the reason why I'm doing this is I think it's an option for you as a racer or as another type of content crea creator you know, to, to share your message and build your brand. Now I'm not going to get super technical in this. I'm not going to talk about like how your, you know, what your file path extensions are going to be or any of that. Um, but I am going to give you the, a lot of the fundamentals, you know, I won't get in all, in all the nuances. Uh, but I think that I'll give you enough to get things started. I mean, I, I already got just in high level topics to cover here. I've got like 19 points to make. Um, so you're probably going to be overwhelmed anyways <laughs> after listening to this show. Uh, but if you, if you do get to that point, a little overwhelmed, go back through, listen to it a few times, um, you know, take some notes or you can always reach out to me for questions. Um, Josh at sponsored rider club podcast.com or on any of the social media sites, you can hit me up there on a direct message. Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to hit, like I said, 19 different points. I'm going to try to put them in chronological order. Some of these things can obviously happen in parallel. Um, 
you know, you might be able to skip some steps, but I'm just going to try to hit them in the most logical way that I could come up with. That doesn't mean it's actually logical, but it's the most logical thing I could come up with. Um, so let's kind of kick this thing off here. I think, I think first and foremost, you got to pick a topic. Um, ideally, it's going to be a, a niche or a niche, however you say that. Um, you know, you can do this two different ways. One is you can pick something that you are really passionate about. Uh, two is that you're going to pick something that people will listen to. Uh, I likely, uh, I guess if you're going to be successful in by successful, I mean, get, uh, a lot of downloads. Um, you're going to want to do both of these. And the reason why I say that is, uh, when you're super passionate about something, it comes out and people are aware of that they can sense how genuine it is. And, you know, if it's a topic that a lot of people want to listen to, you're going to get the downloads, you know, assuming that the, the, the quality of the content is there too. But I think that this is really important. And this is probably where people spend the most time, honestly, is thinking about what they might talk about. Um, I think moving beyond this is when it starts to get real and a little bit more, a little scarier. Um, cause you actually have, you're starting to do things. Um, so this is one of the more fun parts. It's, it's definitely the, the, the ideation phase. Um, but it's also the safest spot because you haven't put anything out into the world yet. Um, you haven't really started to, to pull the levers. Um, but I'm just going to go back to a comment I made. I said, ideally a niche or a niche. Um, the reason I say that is it helps narrow down your audience so you can target them a little bit better. And there's, I don't know how many podcasts out there now. There's just tons of them. Um, be way beyond something that I'm able to, to, to comprehend, uh, which means that there's a, a lot of competition already. Um, and, and basically I think one of the ways that you can, um, make your mark in industry is by getting something out there that people aren't doing, you know, it, for example, this show here, Sponsored Rider Club Podcast. It's motorsports, marketing, and sponsorship. That's the niche. Um, it's broad in the sense that I cover all of motorsports, so there's I don't really restrict what type of motorsports stuff that I talk about. Um, but the topic still remains the same. It's, it's marketing and sponsorship in that world. So that's kind of the niche. Um, but I think that also helps when you get to the point of bringing on sponsors and stuff because you can say, hey, here's my, here's the type of people who are going to be listening to my audience. You know, does that fit what you're trying to do? Obviously, you have, if you have a really big popular show, like, I mean, in comparison to some of the other shows out there, some shows are millions and millions of downloads per episode, right? That's a huge, wide market. Um, if you can hit that, like, that's awesome. If you're in motorsports, likely you're not going to hit those numbers, but, um, there are some really popular, you know, car based podcasts out there that do really well, but that's on like another level. Um, but it is, it is possible. It is possible. So that's the first point, picking that topic. Um, and like I said, it's probably one of the most fun points. The second one here is mapping out your content strategy and your structure. Now, there's a lot that goes into this one alone. Now, when I think of content strategy and structure, I'm thinking of what's your interview style going to be? You know, are you going to do it over the phone with people remotely? Are you going to all do face-to-face -face stuff? Um, are you going to have a co-host? You know, are you going to have multiple co-hosts? Um Maybe you're not even going to be the host. Maybe you just need to find a host. Maybe you're just creating this podcast and you're hiring a host. I don't know. Uh, what's that going to look like? Um, there are a lot of mobile options out there. I mean, you could just record things at races or just record things at shows. And there's different you know, equipment that you would purchase if that's the case. Um, or maybe you're going to do a combination of all of them. Um you might think about doing everything as video first and then releasing it to audio. So, for example, George Hamill, who was just on the show, you know, he records video first and then he converts it to audio. Um, that's the way I do my live episodes. I do uh, video first as a live show and then I convert that to audio. Um, and if you're listening to this, you're like, well, I don't really understand what all the differences is. Podcasts 
the definition really lends itself to being audio based. It is, it's an audio file that you publish out into the world. Um, so you could do just audio only. There's not like a rule book that says you got to do video and audio. Um, people do it. Compl- everybody does it differently. Um, like I said, you could even mix up these things. You can do all of them. You know, every show could be slightly different. Um, but you do have to think about what that's going to be and how you're going to lay it out. Um, you know, I have a structure to my show and, you know, I I map it out in an outline for guests ahead of time. You know, I have my, my background, you know, where I get into sponsorship tactics and strategies. Um, I have lightning rounds in a number of my shows. I've, I've got intros and outros. Like you can, you can map all this stuff out, um, and you can learn and grow and tweak and change it over time. Um, but it's just all these different elements, I think, play into what that strategy is going to be. Um, one of the other things that you have to do, um, which is pretty pretty straightforward, you have to pick whether it's clean or explicit. Now, you can make selections per episode, but you know, I think in general, if you should be looking at a strategy of, is your show going to be uh, clean? Meaning, um, you know, you adhere to the the guidelines for like no cussing. Um, you know, if you're going to do that, you got to make sure that you're editing any of that stuff out or not doing it in the first place. Um, you can do beeps and stuff like that. Um, or if you're going to be explicit where cussing is allowed. So this show is clean. And, uh, I chose that from the very get go because, uh, I wanted this to be something, you know, younger, uh, riders and racers could listen to, um, without, you know, parents thinking that maybe it was inappropriate. Um, but that, that that doesn't need to be that way. It's all your choice. Um, but whatever you do, whatever you choose, you have to make sure you follow that in your show. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble. Um, and then the, the last real point I wanted to talk about here is uh, your release schedule. Is it going to be daily or weekly or more than that? Um, I, I don't know if I'd recommend doing anything other than um, like beyond weekly. Uh, you might be able to get away with twice a month, but there is an element of consistency with this, just like with social media. Uh, so if if you are going beyond a weekly schedule, um, I don't know. I, I, I you'd, you'd have to do a little bit more research on how that works out. I just think that uh, from from my experience, daily or weekly is the the best way to go. Daily is a lot. Holy cow! I could not imagine doing daily myself. Um, but if you have some additional time or if this is something you're going to do full time you know daily might be your best option or if you can produce that much content uh do it but there's plenty of other options in between there too maybe you want to do three days a week maybe you want to do two days a week right there's there's options Uh, i chose weekly um originally but i did end up throwing in two additional episodes each month um so i end up doing six per month but my cadence primarily is weekly i produce an episode every single week um you can pick what days you want to release on i for a long time i released all of my shows on tuesdays and then i changed it to wednesdays and then i changed it to thursdays (laughs) uh i don't know what the right day is um in talking to some other folks in industry i think they recommend tuesdays so i might switch back to that in the future but it's up to you and and how you uh you can work so Either way, mapping out your content strategy and structure I think is pretty important. Um, The next one here, which people get really excited about as well, is picking a title. Now, I chronologically put this after the content strategy and structure because as you're going through it, you might change your title up a little bit. Um, I don't really know what the elements of a good title are. Um, Usually, I think people say... If it can't be clever, it needs to first be clear, or if it it needs to be clear first and then clever. So essentially, you want people to know what they're listening to. Um, for me, I struggled a lot with this um, in picking a title for this show, and I still am not sure if I made the right choice in calling it Sponsored Rider Club Podcast. Um, you know, I won't go into all of my rationale for why I picked that, but... Um, I do think the title makes a big difference because that's that's something that people will see 
probably first. I mean, they might see your cover art first, but that's one of the the, the first things that they're going to be looking at for your show. And they have to make a decision. Do I want to listen to this? Yes or no. Um, and it needs to be clear enough that they know what they're listening to, uh, but clever enough that they want to actually listen to it. So I don't know. I don't have great recommendations on that. You might be able to engage some marketing friends or, um, you know, someone in your family to help you figure that out. Um, you might be able to do some polls on using your existing audience base or whatever to figure out what your title is going to be. But that's a pretty exciting part. And that leads into point four here. Uh, I do think chronologically you should have a title before you do your logo and your podcast cover art. Because most likely you're going to want your title incorporated into that. But it doesn't have to be that way. Um, But yeah, a logo and cover art I think are very critical for your branding and especially with how iTunes uh, or Apple Podcasts promotes your show. So the cover art is, you know, the most prominent thing. Um, it's the most eye-catching thing within these these podcast platforms. Um, you know, Apple Podcasts has very strict rules on what is acceptable for cover art. They And those rules change over time. So do your research. But if you match their requirements, you'll be fine with all the other platforms. Essentially, what they have is some sort of pixel requirement, and uh, it has to be square. So it needs to be a certain size. I think at the time when I made my last one, it was like 3,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels, something like that. So relatively you know, high quality and you know, fairly large image. And then you can map it out. Now, you can pay people to do this. Um, you, if you're, you have some graphic design background, you can do it yourself. Um, you know, Fiverr is a platform that I've used in the past that you can hop on there and um, find people that do this stuff. You, There's tons of people that do podcast cover art. I've literally paid a designer once before to do uh, cover art, and they gave me like 20 renditions of things. And this is when I was changing my my cover art. I've changed my cover art three times. Um, maybe it's four. Yeah, three or four times since starting my show. And, uh, yeah, I paid this person, and I did not like it at all i they gave me all these great options and they were very flexible and i just didn't like it uh so i ended up i've made my own and uh for some reason i just don't know how to convey to people what i want to see um but either way there's a lot of options out there and i think this is pretty important the the logo and cover art um if you don't know what, where to start like i said go find someone else um and put something together i started with something that I really at the time did not like. Um, you know, it was, I made my own logo, I made my own cover art, and I just didn't like it. But I changed it later, and I, I think it was fine. It was it was a fun thing for me to, to kind of tweak over time. And now I really like my, my setup. I don't know if everybody else does, but I do. And uh, it took me a while to get there. So lots of tweaks over time. But it's fun because it, it fits with what your content strategy and your brand, what you want it to be. And that really starts setting the stage for everything else. Okay. So at this point here, um, you know, you've got a title, you've got a strategy, you've got a topic, you got some cover art, some logos, things like that. I think this is a good point to get some feedback. Um, you know, if you already have an audience, you might be comfortable at this point with sharing with them. Um, or if you just have some friends or family that you trust that, that had, has like a marketing mindset or, you know, an artistic flair, whatever it is, uh, start getting their feedback. And if, Hey, do you think that this title is going to be great? What do you think about the logo? Like, you know, is my strategy. Okay. I I think that's great. It's probably good to get feedback throughout the entire process, but to try to bucket this thing into something tangible for you, I think this is a good point to get feedback. Um, and actually, speaking of that, a good point to get feedback. It is also a good point to stop here, take a break, thank the sponsors for the show, and then I'll come back into the remaining points. Let's talk about your truck for a minute. You can count on it to haul your vehicle and your gear to the track or to the trailhead, but I bet you never think about the motor oil. Here's why you should. Your oil is the only thing preventing your engine from wearing out and breaking down. To keep your truck running strong, look for an oil with added wear protection. 
like, for example, Anzoil's signature series, Synthetic Motor Oil. It delivers 75% more engine protection against horsepower loss and wear than is required by the leading industry standard. It provides the next level protection today's demanding engines need to keep running for years and to keep effortlessly towing your ride to the track. Go to amsoil.com slash rider to find out more. Make the switch to Amsoil Synthetic Motor Oil today to keep your vehicle running great. Hey guys, George Hamill here to talk about Solder Weld's new off-road repair kit. If you're a racer of any type or an off-road enthusiast like myself, you're going to want to take a close look at this product that bonds metal on the spot. Solder Weld has combined some of their most elite products into one small kit that fits perfectly under your seat or strapped to a roll cage and allows you to make some insane fixes anywhere you go. How many of us have been in a race or out on the trail and got a rock chip in a radiator or brake line? We have seen a top tier desert race team at the 2019 Min 400 taken out by a simple rock to the radiator. If they had an off-road repair kit on board, they could have been back up and running in just minutes. The kit includes everything you need to work on dirty aluminum, stainless steel, copper, and many other metals. Solder Weld's cutting edge technology allows you to make these fixes with extremely low heat and incredibly high tensile strength, leaving you a lasting fix every time. Don't be that guy broke down on the side of the trail. Get your off-road repair kit today and your friends will thank you. Two questions I get continuously about this show and about sponsorship is do I need my own website and do I need a resume? The answer is, in my opinion, yes to both. And that's why we partner with TopThePodium.com. Now, if you want to see an example of what a professional website and what a professional resume looks like, you got to check out TopThePodium.com. They did my website. The Sponsored Rider Club Podcast website is SponsoredRiderClubPodcast.com. That was created by Jeff Vanistall of TopThePodium.com. I think it's awesome. I get a lot of good feedback about it. And there's a number of other websites out there that Jeff has produced that are just phenomenal. So I think it's important in this world of social media where you have control of your content. That's what a website does. It gives you full control. We don't know what Facebook's going to do sometimes. We don't know what Instagram's going to do. We don't know what Twitter's going to do. So if we don't have that central location to direct people and house our content, there is some risk that we incur. So I strongly recommend getting a website, talking to toptopodium.com. And then the resume, again, is massive. And if you want to stand out, get it done professionally. And honestly, it is one of the best ways to step up your game and present yourself in the best way possible. Safety is our overriding priority. I hear it all the time, but I have to ask myself, is it though? Is that the first thing we think of? Is that the first thing you think of? Over the past couple of years, we've seen the performance of production UTVs increase, I don't know, somewhere around 350%. That means these machines give us a lot more opportunity to have fun and win races, but it also unfortunately gives us new opportunities to crash. And that's why we have partnered with Crash Addict Industries. The owner, Travis Pointer, became very accustomed to crashing early in his career. He saw it as inevitable, and he set out to make the process safer. With a passion for racing, welding, and engineering, Crash Attic Industries now produces full cage and other protection systems intentionally designed to protect you during an accident on the track. They also offer a line of human protection products through their vendors. Do this for me at this point. If you're racing with a stock cage right now, please go check out Crash Attic Industries. Dot com and see, at least just see what they have to offer. Even if you choose to go with a different company, please, please, please make safety your overriding priority. All right, welcome back. We have a number of things left to cover, and there's a couple of these that I th- I think are a little bit more stressful than the others. Um, and this next one particularly, I know I was a little overwhelmed at first, um, and that's buying the equipment. Like, what do I, what equipment do I need? Um, if you see some of like the top podcasts out there, or if you've ever been in the studio, it can be, it's scary. Like they they got a lot going on equipment wise. And I'm here to tell you to get started. You don't need it to be that complicated. Now, 
some of this is going to go back to what your content strategy is and how high of quality you want your audio to be. Um, my recommendation is don't worry as much up front. I think it's better to vet out your topic and your market and make sure that you're going to get um, some listeners before you really invest a ton of money into this. Now, if you have some confidence already and you've done some research, uh, by all means, like go all out. Um, you know, that way your first product is as good as it can be. But there's this, there's this book that I've read. It's called the lean startup. It's written by Eric Reese. And it talks about businesses like when they first get going that sometimes it's more critical to just put something out there, uh, as a, you know, a pilot or a phase one or, you know, 1.0 and like version one, um, and just get it out there versus making it perfect right off the bat. So I, I kind of took that philosophy when I put my show together right or wrong. I don't know, but, uh, basically it's saying that get it out there and, and make sure that it's viable before you get fully invested into it. But I, I think either, either way you do it is fine. Um, I just, I think it, it's a little bit less stressful if you, if you start a little simpler and then build from there. Um, so first thing I think everybody thinks of with, um, starting a podcast for buying equipment is the microphone, uh, or microphones, depending on how you want to do it. Going back to the content strategy, you know, if you're doing it over the phone, um, with somebody, which is how the majority of my shows are, is me interviewing somebody else, uh, over the phone. Um, you know, that's a little, little bit different setup. Um, if you're doing mobile, if you're walking around, it's a different setup, or if you're, you know, primarily in a studio, different setup. Now, the highest quality tends to be in the studio, and you can get, um, you know, all sorts of equipment to have really good studio quality audio. I don't have that. So if you are listening to this right now, I am doing this on a probably one of the nicer USB microphones that you can buy. It's a it's a Yeti um, made by Blue. Uh, prior to this one, and for the majority of the shows that I've done, I, I used a uh, a blue snowball. So the brand is blue. Um, you know, the specific microphone I had a snowball. Now I've got a Yeti. And really, the the upgrade to the Yeti that I, I it has a couple of features that I wanted, like a mute button. I think that's pretty important if you're doing doing shows with somebody to to give you an opportunity to to cough or um, you know, rattle some paper, paper around or whatever it may be without distracting them. And that my first microphone didn't have that. Um, so that's, that's, and I do think that this one has a little bit deeper tone, which is something that I was looking for. Um, but yeah, I started off very simple. I had actually, I think $150 invested in my first setup and which is not bad. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars to get really good quality. Um, and that's what the top podcasts do. Um, mine just doesn't do that. And part of that is because I use the over the phone strategy. Um, and I'm not sending my guests their own microphones to use. So basically my audio is always going to be better than my guests audio. So the difference there, um, basically if my audio is much better, it's always going to be offset by worse audio. So I, it ha it wasn't as critical for me to have my audio quality be, be better. Um, cause I don't want it. Like if mine's perfect and theirs is still really bad, it's, I think it just creates, it just makes it more obvious that theirs is bad. Um, but you could, could do over the phone setups and you can send, um, I know there's other podcasts that do this. They'll, they'll basically have their own little kit, um, with better quality, um, microphones that they send all their guests, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty good idea. I just have decided not to do it. I find it, uh, uh, to be pretty challenging from a time perspective to, to navigate that. But if I had the time, I would definitely do that. Um, I think it's a, it's a good idea, but it, yeah, if you're in a studio and you've got people coming into a studio, uh, or if you're always doing it out of a studio, like it's phenomenal, you can get soundproofing. Um, you know, you can get really good quality stuff. Um, but yeah, for, for me, you know, what I'm going to recommend here, a simple way to get started is a USB microphone. Um, you don't need a mixing board with the USB microphone. It just plugs into a computer. 
Um, very, very, very easy to use. There's hardly any setup required. Um, I think it's a great way to start off. You know, I still use a USB microphone, um, and I and I like it. I think it's it works well with the way that I do my shows. But if I were to, you know, do a, if I were to really go for high quality audio, I would switch to a mixing board style microphone, and I would have, um, you know, a, a much better studio around me because I I record in my in my basement. I mean, it's it's a finished basement, and I, you know, I have a separate room, and I have a, a door that can close and everything. I have some soundproofing, but you know. It, basically the way I'm at a point now, if I was to need to upgrade my audio quality, I'm going to have to upgrade the environment around me first. Um, and those are just things to, to consider. And I, I, I feel right now it's okay. Um, but yeah, if you want to get into a nicer microphone, you're going to get clearer uh, audio as a result. And that's just, that's all there is to it. Um, so it's up to you what you want to do. And uh, I support whatever choice you make, even if it's, you know, recording, you can, you can record right to your cell phone. <laughs> I mean, it could be as simple as that doing a podcast right on your cell phone at while you're driving to work, right? You could do that. Um, it's up to you. Um, I've got a, a, a couple of different setups. So for mobile, I have a, um, a handheld microphone. Um, it was about $150. I think, um, it's iRig is, is the, what it's called. I'm, there's more to it. I just can't remember the rest of it. Um, but yeah, the, it's an iRig microphone and it, it plugs right into my phone and I can just pull it out and hand it to people and say, Hey, like, tell me about yourself. And they can, um, you know, use that. And it, and it gives you pretty good audio quality. Uh, it just picks up everything around you too. So if there's a lot of background noise, it's going to pick that up. Um, then I have a set of uh, really expensive, at least for me, it was a, it was a $500 setup. Um, it's two, um, uh, audio technica BPH S one. Hopefully I got all those numbers, right? Uh, I got two of those and they plug into a, uh, what's something called a, oh, shoot, Scarlet Focusrite, um, basically like a, a little mixing board, um, and it it allows for noise canceling, so I can sit next to somebody and do an interview, um, sitting down or standing up, um, but but you know in one spot and get really good audio quality, and it really cuts down a lot of background noise. So I use that it when I do go to Vegas Torino or other places like that where there's a lot of people walking around a lot going on and it does a good job of canceling out that noise, you know, like you hear at home, um, when like, you know, for right, for example, right now, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this because I, I do pull this out in, uh, in my post editing, but our furnace kicked on and you could hear it in the background. Like I can hear it in the background. Um, a noise canceling headphone setup would get rid of that. You wouldn't have to worry about that at all. Um, but again, it, it adds a little bit more complexity to it. Um, it's not worth it for me to use it at home. Um, I use my other setup um, because it's just in general a little bit easier and I can easily pull out that, um, you know, that background noise of the furnace when it kicks on. Okay. So a lot that can ha go into that. Um, you know, I, I already told you the microphones that I use. I think those are great, great starters. Um, or even for me, I mean, I've done 200 episodes and I, I haven't moved beyond the USB microphone. So it's, it's up to you. Uh, I do recommend a good set of headphones. Um, you know, some good microphone setups have headphones built in, like my noise canceling ones. Um, so I, I think it's critical. Um, one, if you're getting feedback during the show, when I say feedback in this sense, I mean... Uh, sometimes you can hear yourself. So like with this microphone that I have, I have feedback where I can hear myself talking. And I think that helps me regulate my, my noise, uh, how loud I'm talking. Other ones don't do that, but at a minimum when you're editing, I think you need a good set of headphones that are comfortable. Um, you know, I've upgraded mine, uh, recently that to a set that's a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more expensive, but you can start off with really cheap ones. Like I think 17 bucks, you can get a decent set. Um, but yeah, the ones that I have now are very comfortable. Um, I really like the audio technica stuff and how that stuff fits. So all of my headphones now are audio technicas. Um, so next piece is shock mount. And so if you're sitting in a studio, most of what I'm going to talk about now is, is studio type stuff. The shock mount is basically if you bump your microphone, like I'm going to bump my microphone now, you know, you can hear that very directly because I'm hitting the microphone, 
but if I hit my stand, it's a little bit softer. Or if I wiggle, which is what I'm doing right now, you hardly hear it uh, because it basically absorbs that vibration. Um, so shock mount, I think is pretty critical. Pop filter, I also have a pop filter on. So like, it cuts down on the, the P's. Now I'm going to pull my pop filter off. You'll, you'll hear that. Um, it's a little bit you know, more noticeable. I'm putting the pop filter back on now. Um, there's different variations of pop filters, but uh, I think that that's pretty critical in your sound. Um, it's interesting when I look at my, my audio file right now, I can see where I pulled off the pop filter and it looks, it looks nasty. Um, so it is, it is pretty critical. I think to, to have one of those, um, boom stand. Uh, this is something that you don't need necessarily. Um, but it's helpful if you're working at a, a station as well. So I have a computer set up in front of me and I have this boom stand so I can stand up and record. Um, or I can sit down most of the time I end up sitting down. And, uh, but I can move it in and out of the way, um, I'm, and it's basically, it's not taking up desk space. It's above me. Um, that's pretty nice. Um, for the computer, you might already have one, but you know I recommend a laptop with a quiet fan because most likely it's going to be close to you. And literally the first one that I was testing with, my old laptop that I had, had a super loud fan. It sounded like a gen engine going off. So I tried doing sample recordings, and it was just like, this is ridiculous. Um and it wasn't; it couldn't keep up with the computing power. So I ended up picking up a, a PC, a laptop. I use a Microsoft Surface Book, um, and I think that's awesome. I do recommend a laptop um, versus a desktop, just because mobile recording options. Like I can take mine, and I I can go anywhere, and I have all the same capabilities wherever I'm at. If I if, if I'm at my desk or somewhere else, um, you can pick a PC or a Mac. I think Macs are generally referred to as the better option um, for content creation. But I love my, I love the PC, um, and there's plenty of softwares and stuff that work with PCs too. It's it's your preference. I don't know if I, I have much to say there. Other than a lot of the recommendation I have, I've only proven with PC, so I, I don't really know how things would work with a Mac. But um, hardcore Mac people are are uh, going to have a lot more information about how these work. But that's probably the the preference for for most content creators. Um, I recommend having a monitor or monitor set up, you know, so if you have a laptop and it has a big monitor, great, but I use a, um, for, for actually for most of my time, I've used a 24 inch monitor. I upgraded to a 27 inch monitor and that helps me really see the whole audio file when I'm editing it. Um, you can do dual monitor setups, whatever it is, but if you're doing the editing yourself, uh, I recommend a, a nice big monitor so you can really see the detail. Um, I also recommend a, a separate keyboard because uh, laptop keyboards aren't always the most ergonomic. So I recommend that um, as well. Um, if you want to do a docking station setup so you can easily dock and undock your your laptop, that's great too. Um, most of these are not critical. Um, just depends on how much comfort you want, um, you know, how much editing you're doing. For me, I end up spending some three to four hours um, per show doing editing and, and sitting at the computer. So I wanted to have a decent, comfortable setup. Um, and the last thing that I, I kind of want to hit on is, is a mixing board. I don't, I don't use one, um, depends on how good of, uh, quality of content you want to have. Once you get into a mixing board, you're, you're, you're going to give you a lot more options for, um, tuning your, your audio in, um, real time, uh, which is, which is fantastic. Um, if you want to go that route, I, I don't know how to use one necessarily i know some of the basic elements of it but you can find out some other tutorials on how to use one um but yeah that's if you want to get real high quality audio that's the way to go or if you want to do transitions and stuff um in real time that's the way to go all right that was just one point uh, that was a lot that was just point six all that um <laughs> but i'm gonna move on from equipment and uh i'm gonna hit next point here uh set up your recording environment you know, this is, it's as required because you might be mobile anyways, but if you're like me and the majority of your shows are going to be from one location, uh, you want to try to get somewhere that's quiet, pretty obvious and good Wi-Fi. Um, so if you're doing anything with anybody else, whether it's video streaming or, or, you know, I record audio over the internet, um, you're going to want good, good Wi-Fi. I have horrible Wi-Fi and I make it work. 
Um, but the better the Wi-Fi is, the, the, the better signals you're going to get. Um, soundproofing is definitely ideal. Um, I would, I, my life would be a lot easier if my room was soundproofed. I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, when my kids are running around upstairs, um, it would give me some more flexibility for recording times. Um, or like if someone takes a shower or runs a dishwasher, um, I can hear that to an extent in my, in my area, but I do have some soundproofing, um, which, which helps cut that down. But if you can do that, I mean, ideally you'd have a room that's dedicated to it. Um, and yeah, you can get fantastic audio and you don't have to worry about all those other things. Um, I do recommend that it's a dedicated space. You can probably rent space, um, which I think is works too, but you know, my space is dedicated. Uh, I really don't take up that much room for my show in in our house but if you can get a dedicated space where you're not having to set up equipment and tear it down all the time that's perfect because uh, you will find that you'll run out of time very quickly so anything you can optimize <laughs> uh, I recommend optimizing that um, and I think your recording environment should be on brand especially if you plan on doing any pictures or live shows um, but I recommend that any behind the scenes stuff you know Instagram stories or Snapchat or anything like that um, or if you're doing a obviously any any youtube videos uh, i think your your studio should reflect your brand for the longest time i didn't have anything i just had this you know budget basement desk and um, a very limited setup very minimal space and then i started getting into live shows and i i, I made it look more appealing um and more on brand plus it for me it helps having a space that I like to be in, you know, I like to be in my space now. I, I didn't at first for the first, I don't know, 40, 50 episodes. I, I didn't really like where I was working. Um, so I feel a lot better about it now. There's more that I would want to do. Um, but you know, I think that's part of a cont continuous improvement. Um, so yeah, that's the, the recording environment. I think that that's pretty critical. Um, I think that also drives when you can record shows, you know, access to the space. It's going to, it's going to impact what kind of guests you might have uh, on the show because you might only have certain time slots available. So for me, um, you know, I've, I, I do this at home and I, I've got a family, I've got uh, very rambunctious children. Um, so I only record at night during certain times um, so that I'm not waking them up and they're not interfering with my audio quality. Um, you know, I do most of my solo recordings between three and 5 a.m., and then my interviews are usually between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. Um, and yeah, that's just kind of how it works with my environment. If I had a different environment or maybe not a day job, um, I might be able to do those during the day in a, in a soundproof area. So those are your options. Um, for the next segment here, I want to talk about recording and editing software. Um, so for the PC, I recommend something called Audacity, A-U-D-A-C-I-T-Y. It's free. It's super easy. Um, I've always used it. I rarely have issues. Sometimes it crashes, but what program doesn't, honestly? Um, I feel like I can do everything I need to do, and I barely even touch the capabilities of the software. Um, I use noise reduction to pull out background noise. Um, I, can, I can delete uh, audio files. I can... Uh, or segments of audio files. There's just so much that I can do with this software. I, I've not needed anything else. Um, I, I don't know if they have it for Mac or not, um, but there's plenty of recording software out there. I think Mac might come with something called GarageBand. And I, if I'm if I'm saying this accurately, uh, GarageBand is the recommended software for podcast editing if you have a Mac. Uh, but I'm pretty sure they come with it standard. So if you've got a Mac, you're probably already set up for some good audio editing. Um, this is something you can outsource, uh, the, the editing, but I recommend doing your own editing at first. I think it helps you understand what exactly you're outsourcing, uh, might help you define how much it's worth to you. I've always done my editing myself because of how much it does cost for someone else to do it. I've looked into three or four, um, different services for, for editing, and I would love to, not do that. That's the least favorite part of, um, the least favorite. Let's just say I don't like editing. <laughs> let's be, let's be clear on that. I don't like editing, but, uh, I haven't found that the, the cost benefit is there for me yet. Going on to the, the next point here, note taking strategy. I 
think it's critical whether you're doing your own editing or not that you are taking notes. Now, if you have a producer or someone else that can take the notes for you, perfect. That can you can focus on the content. Uh, for me, that I mean, I'm doing my own editing, I'm doing my own producing. Um, I take notes throughout the show. If someone cusses um, or if I cuss, I have to take that out because I I market my show as clean. Um, so I take notes of that. Or if something weird happens, like a dog barks in the background, and I want to I want to take that out. I'll take a note. Or if someone um, talks over another person, I want to clean that up later. I'll take a note. So I'm constantly taking notes with timestamps throughout my show. I use a, a little tablet uh, that links to OneNote, and so in real time I can pull up my OneNote um, on my computer and see the notes that I'm taking. So when I'm editing later, you know, remotely or wherever I end up editing it, I edit all over the place. Um, you know, family events, it doesn't matter. Like it can be in the middle of the night, I can be camping somewhere, I I can edit. Um, but I can pull up my notes anywhere. And that's my my strategy. You can use notebooks. You can use whatever you want. Um, if you're not going to do any editing, if you're going for like a pure raw show, then whatever. Maybe you don't need to take notes. But uh, for me, I think that it's pretty critical. Um, the next one here, call recording. This depends on your strategy. But if you plan to record remotely, uh, this is pretty critical. So when I say remotely, I mean... If you have somebody that you're going to interview that's not in the same room as you, you're going to need some way of recording their audio. Um, I use Skype. There's other call software out there like WebEx. There's there's probably a, a ton of other options, but I've, I use Skype. It's pretty simple. I have a subscription for, um, I think it's like $2.99 a month for each country. So I have United States and Canada that I can make phone calls to um, via either mobile line or landline. So I can call mobile lines or landlines through Skype. That's how I do the majority of my, my shows. I've done a couple of overseas shows and they've, you know, called me through Skype directly, not on a phone. And that's free. That's free to use. And that allows you actually better audio options. So if you call via Skype to someone else that is also using Skype, they can use their microphone set up and you get better audio quality. So when I, uh, interview some people who have their own studios, um, like Jim Beaver, I'll do it that way. And I get a little bit better audio quality. It's not perfect because it's still going over the internet, but, um, it's probably the best, the best option if you're doing remote calling. Um, but you also need to record it somehow. So Skype doesn't necessarily have a way to record your audio that you're doing and now now maybe there's some things that I don't know about you know I'm I'm just sharing my own experience but I've had to use a, a separate software to record it I used to use something called Pamela um, that was what I started with for a long time and I had a, honestly a ton of issues I didn't know how bad I had it <laughs> uh, I would not recommend using Pamela sorry Pamela folks um, I would recommend using something called Talk Helper it's been you know something that's a one time buy I don't know 50 60 bucks so is Pamela um, but essentially, it just records your Skype calls. That's it. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it'll save your audio file, put it together for you, and then you just dump that into your your um, audio recording um, software or your audio editing software. So that's what I use, and uh, I think it works really well. Now, obviously, if you're doing in-studio stu stuff, you're not calling people over the Internet. Um, if your folks are with you there all the time or if it's just you you don't need this you don't have to you can skip this step so if you're just recording shows yourself like me today it's just me um i don't need this software i'm recording straight to audacity no questions all right um we're getting a little bit more tangible here about getting something out into the world because as of right now <laughs> you don't have anything uh out into the world yet um and what you need to do that is something called a, a hosting platform so podcast hosting sites are all over the place. There's there's lots of options. Um, Libsyn is the one that I use. It's L-I-B-S-Y-N. Um, I think it's pretty easy. I've not really had any issues with them. They seem to have pretty good support if there is an issue. Um, but that basically distributes your podcast out to the different platforms. Now, you can set up the platforms. Um, you can pick the ones that you want, but it, it creates that for you. Um, it essentially turns your audio into what's called an RSS feed, and then that's what other podcast players will use. Um, so when you're setting it up, I recommend at a minimum, send your show to Apple Podcasts. 
that's the biggest platform. Uh, for me, it's probably 75% of my downloads come from Apple Podcasts. Um, and I th- say number two is Google Play, Google Play Music. Um, set those two up at a minimum. But honestly, it, it's pretty easy to, to add other platforms, you know, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all these other ones. They have their own little nuances for the most part. But there's also a bunch of them that just automatically set up. I have no idea how it works. Um, so I publish this RSS feed, you know, through Libsyn, and there's these weird players out there that like they just take the show and publish it. So I'm not exactly sure how that works, but uh, the only way I know what all I platforms I'm on is I Google it, <laughs> and uh, I find all these random things out there. Um, but either way, you got to have a hosting platform um, to get your show out there, uh, unless you have. Uh, your own website you know if you just want to host on your own website that's fine Um, but to really get the reach I think you're going to want a hosting platform you know there's different packages you can purchase I think mine's like 24 bucks a month or 23 bucks a month Um, depending on the size of your audio files you know you might need to get a bigger package or if you want statistics uh, that costs money too Um, but yeah not too bad all right next piece here um, it's optional but I think that it adds a little bit of pizzazz to your show and that's uh, background music or, or intros. Um, you know, I started with no background music and I didn't have um, a professional do the intros. I had my wife, which she was kind of a professional. She's super awesome. Um, and she was super bummed when I uh, replaced her with uh, a professional, but uh, I added like, you know, background musics later. And I had like this, you know, a, a professional intro, which I has I still have now. I've got different renditions of the intro that I can use. Um, you don't have to necessarily have that, but I think it adds some flair. Um, it could be super simple or super complicated. It's com- entirely up to you and what you want your show to, to be, but it is something to consider. Uh, the next one, which I encourage this for, you know, any rider racer out there anyways, is to have your own website. Um, you can use the Libsyn site that is there's actually one automatically generated that's pretty low quality, but it gets the job done. Um, or you can create your own for your podcast. You know, I, I used a Libsyn site for a little while, and then um, Jeff at toptopodium.com made uh, a website for my show, and it is just a billion times better than the, the standard one that comes with Libsyn. Um, now, if you have your own skills, you, you can do that. You can create your own uh, website, um, or you can pay somebody to do it. Or maybe you got a friend that's good at this stuff, you know, whatever. Uh, I'd recommend reaching out to Jeff at Top the Podium. Obviously, he's been part of the show for a long time, since episode six, actually. Um, you know, and I I personally think that my website looks awesome, and he created that. Um, and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback that aligns with that. So, all right. Uh, once you get your own website, you can, you can modify how you distribute that audio. Like I have basically, you can click on my website and listen to my full shows right there. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, the, the positive to it is if you're new to the show, you can get it access without downloading or doing anything else. You can just listen to it. Um, you know, so that's, that's a big upside. The downside is, uh, people are not necessarily downloading it to their phone. Um, and Libsyn is not seeing your website, um, listens as a, as a pure download. And, and that's important from a metric standpoint, um, which is important when we talk about monetizing here in a minute, but get a website um, at a minimum. You, you got the lips in one that you could use, or I'm sure other podcasts, hosting platforms, create websites too, but all right, next piece here, social media, social media. This is point 14. No surprise here. I talk about social media and all these shows that I do pretty much. Um, you can leverage the social media that you already have if you're a rider or racer. Um, but you might want something separate for the show. It's, it's up to you. I don't, I don't know what's correct. Um, I think it's great if you already got a, you know, a social media, you want to at a minimum leverage that at a minimum, you want to leverage that, tell people what you're doing. Uh, but you might be directing them over to, you know, a new social media page or profile for your show. It's up to you, but, uh, it's just as important with a, a podcast as it is with your own brand. So it just depends on how you want to do it. Um, next one here I want to talk about is something that is important if you're going to be bringing guests on, and that's a scheduling software. You can do it the old-fashioned way, which I did for like a couple of months, I think, um, 
when I first started the show, and that's, um, you know, calling people or, you know, DMing people or texting them and trying to figure out what time you want to record. That's simple. Uh, what I ended up doing was creating um, my own profile on something called Acuity Scheduling. I've talked about it this on the show before, too. And I basically set aside um, time slots that I pre-approve of. And I have a scheduling link. And I can send these scheduling links out to potential guests. And they can sign up for a time slot. They get a little meeting request. Um, they can reschedule whenever they want. And uh, it's super simple. Um, some people don't fully understand it and you might have to explain it a little bit, but in general, it is greatly streamlined, um, my scheduling activities. So I can just tell people ahead of time, here's the link and they can go in and pick whatever time slot works best for them. So I highly recommend that it was free at the time when I got mine. I don't know if it's still free. Um, but it is, it's worth it if you're scheduling people. All right. The, the next one here is. I don't know. Maybe this is the scariest part of the whole thing is start creating shows and publishing, like get it out there. Um, you know, this is, it's scary because you don't know what's going to happen and odds are pretty high that it's not going to feel good right off the bat. Um, you might not get a lot of downloads. You might not get a lot of social media engagement. Who knows? Maybe it'll blow up. Maybe it's right off the bat. Things just go, go great for you. But the odds are pretty low that that's going to happen um, unless you've got a really good rollout strategy or really good um, base of uh, you know potential listeners. But do it. Get it out there. Um, share it with people. It's okay to ask every single one of your family members to, <laughs> to uh, download, you know, the first show and put some ratings and reviews out there like that. That's cool. But, um, I definitely did that, but I, I, you got to get it out there at some point. Um, I would hate for you to get this far and, uh, not release it. And people do that. People, sometimes they're just like, it's not good enough or it's not what I wanted. I'm not going to release it. And that's fine. Um, but going back to my point earlier about the lean startup, uh, basically just get it out there. Um, part of what they say in this lean startup book is if you're not embarrassed, like that's literally the words they use. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of whatever you release, <laughs> you waited too long. Um, that was super stressful for me to think about, but Hey, uh, it's, a, it's a strategy. So start creating a show, start publishing, get it out there. Um, yeah, go from there. The next point I want to make here is get feedback. So I think this is important right off the bat. Start getting feedback from folks and start making tweaks. I am constantly tweaking my show. Um, sometimes it's very minute where people are not necessarily going to know what I've changed, but I'm constantly changing stuff. Um, yeah, I, you got to get the feedback. You got to make tweaks accordingly. You got to be cautious. Um, sometimes feedback is a little hostile. You know, and, and uh, I don't want you to discount hostile feedback either because there's something that has triggered that. Um, maybe it's something you need to change, but maybe not. Not all feedback is something that you're going to be able to action and not all of it is something you're going to want to action, but it's all important. It's all important. Good stuff, bad stuff, take it all in. All right, next one here, point 17. Um, wait, no, I guess I'm on point 18 now. Uh, <laughs> 17 is monetizing. This is too many points. I think that might be the key takeaway from this. Uh, but either way, monetizing, start this whenever you feel you're ready. Um, you might not ever want to monetize your podcast. Um, it is entirely up to you. This, this goes back to the fundamental elements of what this show is about. Honestly, sponsorship, um, and however you want to do that is it's up to you, but you know someone might want to hop on board based solely on like your podcast plan. You might be able to get a partner, especially if you have existing partners and you're just extending this as part of your brand. You might have someone that's like, let's just do this, um, and they want to they want to be on board right away. Um, others might want to see statistics and performance first. Um, the majority of folks out there are going to want to see that, but. It is possible to launch a podcast with financial support right off the get-go. Um, I'm just don't I, I don't think that's the norm. 
Um, I was super fortunate very early on that Jeff from top the, top the podium.com was on the show and he liked what I was doing and he jumped on board early, early on. You know, I, I barely had, I mean, I six episodes in, I was, and he jumped on board, which is awesome. Um, but I think that, um, you know, monetizing is, it doesn't have to be something you do, but if you're seeking to make this, um, a really big part of what you do, it's going to be critical because everything I talked about for the most part costs money. It does cost money to, to produce these shows. It costs your own time. Um, and especially if you start getting into advertising, like on social media, which I do as well, you will quickly find <laughs> that it, it can start adding up. And I do a very, I do a, a simpler show than what some of these bigger productions can be. It can start adding up very quickly. Um, you know, think about just computers alone. You might be three thousand dollars into a computer um, if you're getting a nicer MacBook, right? It's it can that the money can add up really quickly, and you might have other means of supporting that, or this might be your only means of supporting it. It's up to you how you want to do that. But monetizing is a, a big part of it. Okay, so I I mentioned getting feedback. I mentioned the potential for monetizing, and then this last point that I want to make is make changes. I've already said it a few times through the show, but feel comfortable with tweaking and making changes to your show. Um, like I said, I've made a ton of changes over time and I continue to make changes. I'm going to continue to make changes. There are different microphone setups they can try. There are different recording softwares that you can try. There's different editing techniques you can try different interview styles you can try. I mean, for a while, I did not do solo shows. I, I, it was not part of my strategy. And there was a point where I was like, mm, well, I make up the strategy, so I can probably start doing solo shows. And for me, that was important as a, you know, my, for my personal brand standpoint, for me to feel comfortable enough and competent enough to do solo shows. Early on, I wasn't competent enough. There was nothing that I could share with people that was my own information. I just didn't know enough about the, the, the topic that I was doing to feel competent to share that. And I built it over time, and it, that was something that I, I wanted to be able to do. Um, and honestly, I didn't do it for a while because I felt that it just, like, I couldn't. And then one day I was like, no, I can. And that was a change that I made. Um, you know, I've had people tell me feedback about how I interview, right? Like, Oh, you interrupt the the person, like let them finish. Like, oh yeah, that's a good point. I can do that. Um, so yeah, I think it's good to uh, to get that feedback, like I mentioned a, a couple points ago, and then ultimately make changes. Keep evaluating it. You know, listen to your own show sometimes or all the time, um, and make tweaks accordingly. Well, that is everything that I wanted to cover today. Hopefully you've got enough information now to get started on this or at least really seriously consider um, if you want to do this. It is a, an investment, um, both financially and, and time, but um, for me, it's super fun. Uh, I really like it. It's something I can do um, with my day job and you know with my family life, and uh, yeah, I really like it, so I hope you do too. Um, but if not, no big deal. You can uh, move on from this episode and listen to other ones. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, funny point here, I didn't make it earlier, but if you think about the monetizing piece and what this show is about, if you want help with how to monetize your podcast, just go back through and re-listen to every episode here. Just download all of them, all 200 of them, and listen to them again. Uh, or for the first time, whatever. Uh, that really... The, the way that we try to get motorsports sponsorship is very similar. Honestly, the techniques are transferable for, uh, for podcast sponsorship too. So take a look at that stuff. Um, if you want help with monetizing, but that's it folks at this point, I'm going to leave you with this. Have fun and ride safe. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the sponsored rider club podcast, which is powered by four wheel parts I want you to make sure that you are subscribed to this show, whether it's on iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss upcoming guests and upcoming episodes. And then follow us on social media. We're on all of the platforms. 
You can find out the most content, though, on our Facebook page. That's where we do our live videos. To get some insider access to upcoming guests, you can also check out the Sponsored Rider Club on Facebook. It is a support network where you can ask questions about best practices and get feedback from our audience. A special thanks goes out to our sponsors, Four Wheel Parts, Amsoil, Solder Weld, Bold Racing, TopThePodium.com, and Crash Addict Industries. And I also want to shout out some of our other partners, MBRP, HMK USA, Sudboy Traction, and High Octane Coffee. I look forward to serving you again next week. Until then, have fun and ride safe.